Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody, and I'm giving thanks. The NHL season's just about back. I'm Dan, alongside Matt, as always. Uh, Matt, happy Thanksgiving to you. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody uh, that's listening, and you know, hopefully the flame season doesn't end like a turkey like last year's. Or I'd say a turkey like this past week. I mean, if we look back at these <laughs> games, the Flames started the week on the second with a 5-2 win over... Uh, over the Winnipeg Jets. Then on Wednesday, a big 7-2 loss to the Oilers and another loss on Friday, 3-1 to to the Vancouver Canucks. What are your thoughts on this week? Uh, some encouraging and some discouraging things. Well, what was encouraging for you? Um, well, the, the younger players uh, seeming to be uh, excelling in a lot of ways. Even uh, players that got sent down to uh, the Wranglers camp uh, were fairly good, like Connor Zari and uh, Jeremy Poirier. Um, but, uh, yeah, it it's one of those that, with the new system and, like, people having to, like, relearn how to play offense after last season's debacle, that uh, it's going to take some time. And you can see that passes... Like, the overall concept for the Flames' offensive system is better, but it's like the passes are just a little off because nobody's quite used to where it's things are going. Yeah, and I think we have, especially when we've seen the young guys on the ice, I've seen it in a lot of cases, I think, as a lack of familiarity, too. We have a whole bunch of guys that aren't used to playing with each other, and some of those passing issues, I thought to myself, I wonder if they're just, they don't have that chemistry together. Yeah, and we've seen some weird lines. Yeah, you know, and it never hurts to try different things out. And you've seen guys shift all up and down the lineup to get different looks just to see how things are. And it, once the regular season starts, I'm sure that the lines that are set will just carry on uh, indefinitely. Well, let's talk about the regular season starting. As we record this, it's Thanksgiving Sunday. Uh, the The roster deadline for the regular season is Monday, so there's still a little bit of roster moves there, and the Flames don't play till the 11th, which is uh, Wednesday, and they'll start the season against the Winnipeg Jets. But let's talk about the roster, because I think there's still a few pieces on this roster that coming out of the offseason or coming out of the preseason, um, there's still some question marks about. So um, the Flames... Sorry, go ahead, Matt, if there's anything you want to say about that. Oh, no, uh, I'm in the same boat as you. So looking at where the Flames are at, they pretty much had to make any waiver transactions before end of day today, Sunday, as we record this. And there hasn't been a lot that's happened. So if we take a look at the players who are on the roster that are waiver that are waiver eligible, so guys that would have to clear waivers to go down at this point, uh, let's start on the back end. Two goaltenders, Jacob Markstrom and Dan Vladar. We saw Dustin Wolf sent down to the Wranglers earlier this week, and... I know a lot of people were upset by that. That's kind of what I expected to happen. And we've talked about this before. I think you have to start with the two guys that obviously have to clear waivers to go down. You don't want to run three goalies at the beginning. Do I think that Wolf will play this season in the NHL? Yes. I'd say probably at least 10 games. Do I think that these two, Vladar and Markstrom, will be the two guys here at the end of the season? I think it's really right now for Dan Vladar to not let Dan, Dustin Wolf pass him in the depth chart. Yeah, exactly. And I think that with how uh, situations around the NHL, like there are a number of teams where like they just need a goaltender. Um, there are where, now, and there's always that one team that loses their goalie early too. Yeah, and the Flames have the luxury of three guys. And ideally, you know, contract-wise, you would want to ship Marks from out. Um, he has no just, movement, though, so it's going to be really hard. I know, and it's one of those where it just, the whole situation depends. And, you know, like if Markstrom continues to play like he did last season, and, you know, uh, like it, it not really NHL caliber goaltending, then, you know, you're going to see Vladar get the lion's share of the starts and, you know, look for avenues to change up the situation because if that happens then like the team just cannot you know lose another season because of 
uh, goaltending issues. And Vladar was the shining star for the Flames a lot of times last year. I mean, you and I talked about, you know, maybe we should give the net to Vladar at some points. And this guy's also only played 55 NHL games. Not 55 starts, but 55 games. So I think there's still something to be found out there. What is Dan Vladar as an NHL goalie? And I hate to move on from him if, you know, he is the next starter. Yeah, and realistically, like a lot of goalies don't really get their legs under them until they're 26 or 27 and And he's 26 yeah and it's one of those where he can take off and you know like just to use an example from flames history like mika kiprasov was kind of a mediocre backup with the san jose sharks through the early part of his career got traded here when he was 26 and we know the history of that and it's one of those where like with marks from being older you know the ideal situation is you move on from marks from either way uh just age and contract but you know it'll be interesting to see because especially like if marks from struggles uh like he has during the preseason and all of last year that you know vladar will be given the runway to just take off and I think that last year they played Markstrom more than they wanted to. And you see this all the time. A team gets in a jam and they go to their starter. And I think the plan was probably to play, I would say, Markstrom in 45, maybe 50 starts total. And I think that, you know, with Ryan Huska, who's a younger coach, new ideas, I think that the plan is going to be to, to even if Markstrom's doing well, limit his minutes this year because he is an older goalie. Um, you know, make sure that we know that we can rely on him for the games we need him for, but also make sure we have a backup we can rely on. And whether that's Vladar or Wolf, I think time will tell, but I think it's Dan Vladar's job to lose at this point. Yeah. And realistically, you know, Vladar is getting to the point in his career where he needs to start establishing himself as an NHL starter because Wolf is right there and will take that job from him. And and if he struggles at all. So I could you know, see him becoming it, the next David Riddick, where he kind of he was a starter here because they needed him to be, and then he kind of fades into obscurity when he leaves. Entirely possible, and it's one of those where it's a good situation to have three legitimate options instead of you know just praying that your one goalie doesn't you know fall apart, and then okay now what? Yeah, <laughs> but you know at least Oscar like, Dance, come on down. Yeah. Hey, where's uh, you know, so and so and so and so, you know, like, but yeah. Hey, is there a waiver goalie? <laughs> you know, well, where's it, Noodles? We can yeah. put him on emergency contract. Well, like when we got Joey McDonald, it's yeah. like, hey, you're an NHL goaltender, exactly. and then he did better than Siglitz, most of the guys we the had. <laughs> back on, you're going in. Yep. Um, yeah. So I think that one's pretty clear. Let's move on to the defense. As of now, the guys who the Flames still have on the roster that are not that uh, can't go through waivers or can't go down without going through waivers are Mackenzie Weger, Rasmus Anderson, Noah Hannafin, Chris Tanev, Jordan Osterley, Nikita Zadorov, and Dennis Gilbert. So that's one, two, three, four, uh, five, six. That's seven defensemen. And really, I think with Oliver Shillington still away, I mean, I'm a little bit worried because he was supposed to be away for the beginning of camp and he's still away. I think that that's probably the group that you see um, that you're going to see to start with. And I know you and other people have wanted Solovyov to be in that group, but right now with Solovyov's development, I would rather he goes to the AHL and plays one, two minutes than six, seven minutes on an NHL roster. And I agree with you. Um, it, it, how would you say the between the difference between Osterley and Solovyov is probably negligible, if not like Solovyov getting a slight edge on that right now uh but for the time being as you said getting one two minutes down there uh probably being paired with poirier to start the year you know give him some runway and then you know later on if you need more from your depth or any injuries you know that guy's ready and willing to step in yeah, and I do think Solovyov will be up here at some point. I think he's probably one of the first call-ups, especially yeah. if it's and a long-term he, call-up. Yeah, and he has impressed me thoroughly. And like to me, in my mind, he's an NHL player right now. And 
you know, it's just a matter of contracts and working out the details more so than not. And, you know, he has looked excellent in every game. He has. And, and you know, he wasn't a one-two guy last year. So I think before you push him up, sort of like Dustin Wolf, before you bring him up just so he looks good, make sure he can do it as the number one. And, I mean, we've seen Wolf do that the last couple of years, but, you know, we want to make sure he had that AHL experience before we did that. I think we're still doing that with Zari as well, guys like that, of show us you can do this in a high-level role in the American League. Yeah, like looking at Connor Zari, if, just because you mentioned him, that, you know, like I'm expecting his season upcoming to basically mirror uh, Jacob Peltier's from last year, where excel for the first couple months and then we'll recall you at some point. And the then, big difference between the two, the coach will know his name when he comes up and his number. Yeah, yeah. well, hey, you know, baby steps. That's right, <laughs> that's right. Um, uh, who are you? <laughs> well, because remember Sutter did that stupid press conference oh, where he said, what's his number? And uh, Pelty even referenced that this year when he switched to 22 and the media asked him why. He said it's easier for the coach to remember. Yeah, well, you know, the, you just need to get that uh, the Who song on there. You know, who are you? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so I, I think that if we look at Uyghur, Anderson, Hannafin, Tanev, Osterly, Zadorov, Gilbert, I think that's a good top yeah. seven. I think Gilbert ends up as the seven there, and I think Gilbert will go on waivers if Shillington comes back. I think Osterly stays in the NHL at this point, but I think Gilbert's yeah. the odd man out, and I think he'll clear Gilbert through waivers if you put him down. Oh, yeah, and Osterly would then become the number seven if Shillington comes back. I agree, yeah. At, at this point, because of the fact that Shillington uh, – Missed the entire preseason. I, I'm kind of expecting him not to be back at all. Me too. And I don't mean this to sound, you know, negative or anything, but with the tools in the CBA, I think the Flames have to suspend him at this point because they need the cap room right now. And you don't get that cap relief. Unless, I mean, unless they can put him on IR for the for however long, which I don't know if they can. But if not, I think you've got to suspend him for not reporting. And then when he comes back, deal with it then. Yeah, something like that. I, I'm not saying he should be suspended, but the tools available in the CBA, that's the only other one if yeah, you need the cap and, room back. Yeah, and realistically, the, the Flames, like in order to get replacement players for Shillington and some of the injured guys, like they, they will have to place guys on the IR and or suspend Shillington. Like it, it, it's not well, and Right now, the Flames are almost a million dollars over the cap, so they're going to have to find something to do with his $2 million contract. Yeah. Because last year he wasn't on the IR at all, and they just floated that money against the cap. Yeah, uh, it's just an um, unfortunate situation, and wish him all the best. It's just, it's also a business, and you know, the, it's the cap. Like you have. Yeah, to and be I under think if and... he can come back and prove he's ready, great. Um, I know that there's also some things they can do with like a, a conditioning stint to the American League, see if he's ready, and that sort of thing. So I think when and if he comes back, there will be options there, but. I think you'll see him if he does come back, just because, like you said, he missed camp. Coming back being the seventh or eighth and working his way back in the lineup slowly, if and when that happens. Yeah. And everybody will be cheering him on once he does return. It's just, you know, in the meantime, you have to kind of take care of business. And, you know, it, it is what it is. And then on the forward side, the Flames currently have Jonathan Huberto, Elias Lindholm, Andre, Andrew Mangiapane, Adam Rajicka, Nazem Kadri, Dylan Dubé, Igor Sharangovich, Michael Backlund, Blake Coleman, Walker Dewar, and Dryden Hunt, who don't have to clear waivers. So altogether, that's 20 players at this point. Um, Dewar, I think you and I said last year, would probably make this roster, and I still think he does. I don't know if he stays here all year, but I think he yeah, makes the opening uh, day roster. To me, uh, he's been the most consistently good player amongst the forward groups at doing the things he does. I agree. And I think the Dryden Hunt will make the team as the 13th forward. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he's he's a local Calgary guy. I think he wants to be here. He played well last year in the AHL. I think you could probably clear him through waivers, but he's like he's an older player right now, Dryden Hunt. He's kind of one yeah. of those guys that you know what you've got out of him. He's 27. You know what you've got out of him at the American League level. I think, you know, he's just going to kind of be an AHL you know, I don't think he's good enough to be your top line AHL guy. I think he's kind of your mid six AHL guy or your NHL tweener. And right now, let's give him a shot at the NHL tweener role. Yep, and especially with Rooney and Peltier being out, we need somebody. And 
frankly, you know, he's played well enough to be the extra guy at the minimum. And yeah, I think he's know. at least earned the right to start the season on in the Calgary Flames. Yep. And do I expect him to stay up all year? Not necessarily. Like, especially as Peltier and Rooney get back. Uh, but we'll see. Um, he did not look terrible in any of the games. So, you know, he didn't really stand out overly positive either. He was just a serviceable player. I agree. And then as you mentioned, the guys that are currently hurt and not available for the opening day is Shillington, uh, who we talked about, Jacob Peltier with a shoulder injury, and Kevin Rooney also with a shoulder injury. So between the two of them, we have two good shoulders. Yep. And there's four guys currently at camp. And remember, the Flames have 23 that we mentioned who are not waiver eligible. Um, or sorry, who are waiver eligible, who are not eligible to go down without waivers. And then there's four guys left at camp who can clear waivers. Matt Coronado, Cole Schwint, Ilya Sol- Solovyev, Solovyev, and Adam. I still mess up that name. It's a lot yep. of it's a lot of O's. I know, Solovyev. A- and Adam Klapka. So I think... Right now, and we talked about this earlier, I still think that there's a case to be made for Matt Coronado going to the American League this year and tearing it up. But with Peltier out, I think that Coronado, and also the way that Coronado's played in the preseason, I think he's earned an NHL job. Yeah, I agree. So that's 21. Yeah. Uh, Cole he, he, he blew the doors down. He and did. said, I'm here, so yeah. too bad. Well, <laughs> and, he, and going all the way back to the rookie tournament in Penticton, I mean, he was the best-looking guy in that whole tournament. Like, he's shown – I, I don't know if he'll stay here all year, but he's shown that he should earn the right to be yeah. on the, you know, the opening day roster. Yep, and I'm sure that, like, he'll have a good couple months and then struggle a bit because that's generally how young players look. they come up they they do good for a few months get some success then you know the league adjusts to them a bit and they have to figure out how to readjust to the league and well not you know, just the league but the lifestyle i mean he's used to playing college hockey and now he's going to be getting all the travel all the grind all the things that go with the nhl where he hasn't been in the american league to learn some of those so i think you know yes there's that on ice adapting to him but I think these guys have to learn how to adapt to the lifestyle of a pro as well. Yep. And it's good. We'll be good to see. And, you know, you just hope that he has a good season and stays injury free and can score some timely goals. Uh, right now, Cole Schwint still on the roster as we're recording. I think he'll be going down. Yeah. He looked good enough in the similar manner that uh, Dryden Hunt did where, you know, he, he could play at the NHL level as like your 12th forward and be perfectly fine. Is he exceptional? No. Is he bad? No. It's no, but I still think he's got some things you could learn at the American league level. I agree. And that's where like the first, second line duties down there would benefit him and where you would see hunt stay in the NHL for this year. Yeah. At least to start with. Yeah, exactly. And I think you'd tell Schwint, you know, beat Dryden hunt for the job. Yep. Um, Solovyev, we both said is going down to start. We think just cause I mean, they've already got seven D men and it's probably the best place for him. What about Adam Klapka? You and I have gone back and forth on Klapka. Honestly, I think he sticks. You think he'll stay on the roster? Yeah. I, I would be somewhat surprised, um, if he wasn't at least the 12th or 13th forward just because of his unique attributes that he brings to the, the team. Because, you know, he's freaking huge, and he hits, and the Flames don't really have too many physical presences on the forward group besides that. And, you know, he'll keep players honest, at least, uh, because he is willing to engage in the fisticuffs if need be. And he has not looked out of place defensively and has been fairly solid. Not great, again, because, you know, we're expecting him to be a fourth liner. But, you know, I think he's done enough where he deserves a shot in the NHL. Of those three, two, and if you're looking to maximize your money, um, Klapka's the cheapest. If you want to keep one and you're buttoned up against the cap, I could see him staying there. I know what you're saying about Klapka looking good, and I agree with you, and I think he'll be here. I don't think he'll be here all year. I think there's a guy no. that's going to go up and down. I agree. And I wouldn't be surprised if he starts in the American League level just because I think they're going to want to get a little bit of cap relief, put some guys on the IR, and build up a little bit of, uh, of long-term uh, injury reserve on that. 
So I'm guessing that Adam Klapka starts in the AHL. They'll do a little bit of uh, of roster maneuvering, and then you'll maybe see him brought back around the end of the month. Yeah. And basically, like, I'm figuring that his season will mirror uh, Redeem Zahorna's from last year, where up and down and up and down and up and down. Yeah. Throughout the year. And when necessary, you'll see him, and when not, you know back to the Wranglers but it's one of those where he's shown enough where I think he's on the verge if not ready to make the show to see what he has as a actual NHL player now of those guys I mean I think that when we look at it Klapka's a winger Schwint is a a center so I think also depending on how the Flames want to utilize their roster it'll depend if it's going to be Klapka or Schwint brought back up True. And with the Flames needing a fourth line center, unless they want to throw Dubé there, you know, like I, I think Dryden Hunt could go there. I think he has some center experience. Yeah. It, it's one of those where it, it makes life a little bit more difficult. Uh, just, it, you know, like you, you'd literally have to put Dubé there as like a guy who's been a full time center. Yeah. I think uh, Hunt has been primarily a winger uh, throughout his he has, career. Yeah, um, he could go there, but because he was when he was a young player, but you know, not ideal. When but, Peltier gets healthy, he makes the NHL team. Yeah, for sure. When when Rooney gets healthy, does he make the NHL team? Honestly, I would not be surprised if they tried him out because he is an NHL player. And then last year, he like that was not the same guy that I because I've watched a number of Rangers games and Devils. We were games. both excited by that pick when they or that pickup when they made it. Yeah, like he's he's a reasonably good fourth liner, and for whatever reason, he and Sutter's system were like oil and water. Like it just did not mix at all. <laughs> and, yeah. Like and he was then then bad in the Flames farm team too, which like it just defied logic because he was not a bad player. Like he was. I don't actually know if he was of, bad down there. I think he was a serviceable AHLer, but I mean he's not like a pure scorer guy. I think no, he was a role player, and that's I think what you're expecting from a guy who's going to be in your fourth line. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what you know, like what iteration of you know, like are you getting Rangers or Devils, Rooney or whatever last year's edition was when he returns and we'll see. Yeah. I think he might get a couple games here, but I think ultimately he'll probably end up on the Wranglers. I I would assume so as well. I think that they'll give him a shot just because, you know, they owe him that for signing him up for the two year deal. It like, it's not his fault. He got hurt and, you know, be respectful to the guy and then, so the if 20- he doesn't cut it, then go. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And this is the last year of that two-year deal. I think give him a shot. He didn't get the chance to show you what he can do in training camp. So bring him in, let him show you what he can do, and then make a decision from there. Yep. And if he sticks, great. So with the 20 guys that we talked about who would have to clear waivers, we add Coronado, and we're adding one forward. Let's call it uh, either um, Schwint or Klapka. That brings us to... 22 guys they can ice 23 maximum i think that's probably as many as they'll carry because i mean you don't need to carry the extra defenseman when you can call him up and he's right down the hall yeah so i think that unless say shillington comes back you'll probably see them carry 22 for most of the year yep or a long road trip or something like that but i think the opening day will be 22 i agree with that another guy in that group that i want to talk about is igor sharon govich I didn't know what to expect from this guy coming in. Honestly, I didn't even know there was a guy in the league named Igor Sharon Govich. I mean, we see New Jersey twice a year. He wasn't a huge part of their team. The Calgary Flames gave up a big asset to get him and signed him to a fairly large deal. Um, he's, what is he, four and four million, uh, 3.1 million for two years. And, you know, I kind of thought, okay. Conroy knows something here that we don't know. Conroy's seen this guy. Conroy scouted this guy. Conroy has the book on this guy, knows what he's doing and what he wants out of Sharon Govich. But Matt, I'm getting less and less convinced every day. Now, I think there's two ways to look at this player. If we look at him purely as himself or if we look at who we traded him for. For the guy that we traded a top line right winger in to Foley for, they've had Sharon Govich on the fourth line some games. Like I'm just, I'm not convinced 
right now. And of course, the preseason's just ending, and we'll see what he does. But right now, I'm not convinced this is the best return for the Flames on Toffoli. Well, Sharon Govich, to me, uh, reminds me of another Flames player, uh, Blake Coleman, uh, where he does the defensive side of the game reasonably well. And he's not as physical as Coleman, but similar to Coleman, he has a really dynamite shot. And he did score that one goal that was like one-tenth of a second after, you know, time expired and all that in that one game. And he has shown the shot a little bit. And I think that, like, with the Flames throughout the preseason, that they were kind of trying to see players, like, especially the new guys, uh, in different situations, and I think they were trying him, in, you know, like in the third and fourth line roles to see, like, his defensive game more so, and put an emphasis on that to see what you actually have as a two way forward. Um, so that way, when the games actually matter, you know, you can rely on or not rely on that guy. And I'm trying to look at it, you know, and he has performed relatively well on the defensive aspect of it. He hasn't been getting a ton of offensive opportunities, which also makes sense because you want to give uh, the you know the guys like Coronado uh, you know an, a chance to establish themselves in the NHLer and all of that. And yeah, I mean we know Sharon Govich is going to make the roster. Where he plays, we don't know, but yeah, you don't need to give him a ton of you know opportunity to make the team like you do some of those other guys. Yeah, and so I think that like he will find his own line mates when. And, and where I like for me, I think that he'll start on the third line uh, with Backland and Col- uh, Coronado um, and then see how thing, you know, like because every time the team struggles a bit, you sh- shift up the lines. And if he's playing reasonably well, he'll probably get put on Huberdo's line or some other place to see where the chemistry between those players are. And, you know, if for now, um, I think that you'll see him start a little lower in the lineup than, you know, first, second line winger. I think uh, it also helps with expectations to start him lower. Yeah. And it, how would you say he's a young player? He's only 25, just turned 25. He, he's only been in the league a couple of years and he's coming to a new city and a new system. And it'll take a minute for him to, you know, like we saw... Out. Yeah, you, we saw with guys like Dougie Hamilton, where for the first month or two, like they were not very good, and I then mean, after arguably that, <laughs> even with Jonathan Huberto, wasn't good for a year. Yeah, and it's one of those where I think easing him in, um, especially because this is a guy that I think w- if he turns out will be a longer term flame, uh, and because of his age, like y- you could see this player playing in Calgary for six, seven, eight, nine years. Um, so it, you know, it's more of, a finding a way to make him successful in our system and, you know, give him the best opportunity. The big difference to me between him and Coleman, Coleman's much more of a two way player. Coleman's a two way player with offensive potential. I don't see the two way game in Sharon Govich. I get the sense that he's a good offensive guy, but he doesn't think the game may be as high level as, as some of the top six forwards should. Mm hmm. And again, uh, it depends. Um, I, I've seen him play a little bit in New Jersey, and like they did have him in certain defensive situations, and he didn't play badly. Uh, but it, it's one of those where, like, if he's not bringing all aspects of his game, like he's going to struggle mightily. And that's part of why he didn't play in the postseason last year with New Jersey. A, they had enough other guys that it made sense to leave the guy who was somewhat struggling off. But, you know, it, it's one of those where the fl- he's got a lot of potential to be that, like, 20-goal, 50-point guy. And I think they need him to be more offensive than defensive. Like, I mean, they've got enough guys that can be the two-way forwards. Yeah, and I think, like, they're... Well, they, they've pretty much got a cadre of uh, different guys like Dubé and... Interesting Mangiovane. choice, a cadre. Yes, exactly. Uh, Sharon Govich, Coleman, Backlund, who are kind of all of that 
good second, third line two way guy that you can, you know, move in and out of the lineup and up and down where you need them. And, you know, trying to kind of groom them all to be like the every man type guy where you can plug and play when and if, depending on situations. So you'd mentioned lines. So let's talk about that. What do you see as the, let's call them the, I don't want to, we'll say opening day, but I would say even kind of the default start of the season lines for this team. Uh, for me, I, I would assume that uh, Huberdeau plays with Lindholm and Mangiapane. Just to, I, uh, I think they wanted Sharon Govich then. I think he might get there, but I think Mangiapane is going to get the look there. I think yeah. Mange, like everybody, had a, a disappointing season last year, but I think he'll definitely you know start on the first line. Well, especially with Mangiapane, like if he has a season that's poor, like last year, um. You know, like he'll he will only have one year left at six million, and you know, like he needs to play at least like he's a four or five million dollar player. Like last year, he played like he was a two to three million dollar player, and you know, I think it's it, a good it's, year for us to see what we've got in Andrew Mangiapane. Yeah, and if he's only a two or three million dollar guy again this year, you might need to look at trading or buying out that contract so giving him an opportunity and a proper shot at being a first line winger uh with the the key stars on the team makes a lot of sense and who's your second line uh probably uh dube cadre and either sharon govich or coleman uh maybe coronado uh i'm not sure i, I, think, I think the way coronado's played you've got to start him in the top six yeah, and that's where, like, I'm kind of in between, the you know, sheltering him with Backlund or playing him with Kadri. It, you know, I think that'll be a coach's decision. I think you'll probably see Sharon Govich on the left, Kadri at center, and Coronado on the right of that line to start with. Yeah, I could see that. I I think that it'll be either Dubé on the second line left wing or as the fourth line center, um, depending on... Yeah, you know, versatility and need. Okay, so then who, what's your third line? Uh, Sharon Govich or Coleman on the left side. Um, Backlund and maybe Ruzitska. Uh If It depends. Like if um, you could have Ruzitska on the second line left wing or third line left wing and uh, Coleman on the right side or uh, Ruzitska on the fourth line and Sharon Govich with Coleman. I think to start the season, you're going to see Coleman, Backlund, Dubé as your third line. Yeah, I could see that. And then I think the fourth line will be Rujicka at center, Walker Dewar on the right, and uh, still to be named who's on the left, whether that's Dryden Hunt, whether that's one of the other guys. I, th- I think that... Yeah, you know, make, it, make it Klapka so that way you have three giants on the fourth line and just tell them to hit anything that moves. And yeah, I think Klapka would work. I think Hunt would work because he's a speedier guy to go with those two. I think... Um, you know, the, the Cole Schwint could go in there. I, I think that we know who two of those guys are. It's just a matter of who the third is. Yeah. And I think right now the flames need Adam Rujicka to be a center. Yeah. Or frankly, they need him to be an NHL quality player, whether he's like the second line left wing or the fourth line center or the third line left wing, they need him to be a legit player in one of those See, and roles. To me, he hasn't shown enough to be your second line winger. Like when I'm looking at that, I think Sharon Govich is above him. Even Dylan Dubé playing left is probably above him. Coleman, like I think Rajesh got start on the bottom six. And it's one of those where like last year when he got the opportunity in the top six, he actually played really well. But we don't know it, if that's a fluke. I mean, this is a guy who's known for inconsistency. Yeah, and that's where, you know, I think this will be one of those guys that you just see experimented here, there, and everywhere until he finds a fit and then either stays or plays himself out of that role. Yep. Yeah, I think he'll probably be here all year, but I could see him do- dropping down to the 13th forward role. Yeah. Well, I think that, oh, and then let's go, I think that covers it for the forwards. Let's go down to the defense. What do you think our pairs are for opening day? Hannafin Anderson, um, Uyghur, Tanev, Zadorov, and Osterley. Uh, if Shillington's back, Zadorov would be with Shillington. Shillington or, will be back for opening day, though. 
Yeah. Uh, or uh, it, if Soloviev makes the team, he'd be with Zadorov. Yeah, I think you're right. It's going to be Hannah Van Anderson, pair one, Uyghur, Tanev, until Tanev gets hurt. I hate to say it that way. Um, but we know it'll happen. And then Zadorov and I'm saying Osterley to start with. Yeah. And then obviously we know who the goaltenders are. Yeah. So with that lineup, the Flames have announced their uh, their leadership crew. We knew that Backlund's going to be the captain. And Matt, the four alternates that have been named are Elias Lindholm, Jonathan Huberdo, uh, Rasmus Anderson and Chris Tanev. Any surprises? No. Uh, well, slightly. Um, Lindholm being a part of that, I think that um, the Flames and him are probably getting closer to a long-term contract, and that's why he's a part of that. I, I think that if it was not close, then uh, I think that you would not have seen that necessarily extended to him and given to Kadri instead. But... Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see. And I think that realistically Lindholm's realizing that like this team still is fairly decent and you know, they, they have a couple of really young, exciting forwards that are coming up and you know, like this team could be on, you know, on pace to, you know, make some waves again. It just depends on how everything shakes out. I got the same sense you did. When I saw that Lindholm was in there, I thought, huh, um, he is probably coming back or they have a good indication he's probably coming back if they're giving him that A. Like, I think there's, I think we can read a little bit into that. Yeah. Because, like, frankly, like, if Backlund hadn't re-signed, I don't think he would have had an no, A or a C. I I don't think I, so. But. And I mean, it was being pegged by, you know, journalists in the media um, and the people that were in the know that Anderson was probably the next captain if Backlund didn't come back. So I think Anderson's being put in there as the heir apparent. I think, I mean, Tano has been an alternate for years. I agree with you about uh, Lindholm and I think Huberto probably makes sense to go there as well. Two forwards, two D-men. Yep. They can't have four alternates on the ice at once, according to NHL rules. So you'll probably see two of two these at guys home. A- yeah. at home and two on the road. My guess would be one forward, one D at home, and one forward, one D on the road. Yeah. We don't know and, who's who, yeah. but we'll and find I out ass- opening day. Yeah, I would kind of assume uh, Huberto and Anderson would be the home guys and Lindholm and Dan have the road guys. But I think that's a fair assumption. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, I think I think that's probably fair too. And and I was if I had to predict, I would probably go the same way. And then one last piece of news here before we uh I guess look ahead to the next season and read some listener feedback. The Flames will be wearing three jerseys at home this year. It's been announced. Um they will be bringing back I guess their their black blasty what was it called? The reverse no, not the reverse retro, but the black blasty one from the last couple of seasons will be back. Not the reverse retro, so they'll wear that. In 13 home games, uh, they will wear their Heritage Classic in three games, two, one home and two on the road. And they will wear their traditional red home jersey in 27 home games. So they're going to be wearing three three jerseys this year. If you want the breakdown, you can find it on Flames Nation. That's where I found it. Our friend Ryan Pike has posted the whole schedule in there. But interesting it's going to be weird to have i mean we we had one season we had last season we had two black jerseys it's going to be weird to kind of have a uh two whites really a red and a black this year and the fact that they're wearing the white one at home means that we'll have edmonton in blue in the dome which is it's been a long time since that's happened yeah what year do they make the switch i don't even remember uh i think it was like oh six oh seven something around something there. like that yeah because I actually really prefer it the other way where the home team wears the white jerseys because it just makes it more visually interesting seeing the other team's kits instead of, oh, well, you've talked about red it. on I mean, white. Uh, yeah, I, I think it would also work, and we'll get into this another time, but I think having colored on colored unless they're the same color. Yeah. Or you just have a death match like between Calgary and the Ottawa Senators where, yeah, who knows who's passing to who. <laughs> well, there you go. Blackhawks just wear a black jersey. It's in your name. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think I, I I like the colored at home. Like I like the sea of red and that sort of thing. But I, I get where you're coming from. No. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to talking about the some more things about the season coming up and making some predictions, I just wanted to read a quick quote here from one of our listeners, Al. He commented, "I'll read 
part of this. Um, not the whole thing, but I'll read part of it. If anyone wants to read the full thing, it's a comment on our website at firesidechat.ca. You can go to episode 332 and you'll see his comment at the bottom. Uh, he said, I appreciate the sensitivity and sentiments on the opening segment regarding Chris Snow. Upon hearing you speak on the subject, I must admit that I was a fence sitter when it came to Backlund as captain, but after hearing you, you and your reasoning, it made more sense to me. On the topic of the jerseys, which we talked about last week, the Heritage Classic ones, instead of trying to make them fancy, how about the organization trying to find a way to make them affordable to the masses instead of those that can pony up 10 hours of wages? And Al, I agree with you. I hate to buy new jerseys at the price of selling them, but I hate to say it, licensing and also supply and demand. People will pay it so they can charge it, right? If you look at all pro sports, jerseys are expensive because it's kind of a luxury item. I wish they could have a lower end, and we did see that with sort of the Fanatics jersey and the non-Fanatics jersey in the past. But I think especially for a special jersey like, you know, and I could even see at some point where the jerseys, the regular home jerseys go down in price if you bought them with the ad on them. Thankfully, the Flames still don't have an ad, knock on wood. Um, But I think for specialty jerseys like this, you're always going to see a high price. Yeah, and that's why, like, all-star game jerseys are always ridiculously expensive. Like, they're usually, like, $100 more than just the regular base jerseys for that reason as well. And, you know, it it is unfortunately the way it works. And, And, you know, as much as we sons make fun of them, I mean, there are jerseys at Walmart you can buy that are not the official one that have a slightly different striping pattern. I see enough people at the games and at bars around the city wearing those, so... I, I think there are affordable options. They have those t-shirts that sort of look like a jersey with the Flames logo on the front and the name and number on the back. I think that it doesn't have to be cost prohibitive to get into the sea of red. And I think even if you want a jersey, I mean, last time I was at Fanatic, I saw they were selling jerseys, you know, like last year's jerseys or jerseys with names of guys like Lucic that aren't here for cheap. I think if you want a jersey, you can find one for fairly cheap in the city. I was at the thrift store this week. They had two Flames jerseys on the rack. Like, you can find them, but I think any special event jersey or reverse retro or special thing like that, it's always going to cost more because it's a bit of a rarity. Yeah, and especially like the reverse retros, they only made a small amount of them to drive the demand for them. And like, they only made the one printing of them, and that's it. So, you know, to kind of make like the limited edition, you know, hard to find one. It's too of, bad, but I yeah. don't think it's going to change. No, of course not. And that's why the sour cap is where it is. Yep. And uh, Al finishes here by saying, keep up the good broadcasting, guys. You make a great team. So thanks, Al. Thanks for writing in. We always love listener feedback. And Matt, it's time to get your crystal ball out. Um, it's time to look ahead to... We threw out last season's crystal ball because it was clearly defective. <laughs> You know, we ha- we've I've looked back at these every season we've done them, and we're about 50%. Yeah. Last year, though, it was like 10%. <laughs> I think it was for everybody. Every yeah. pundit and analyst. Yeah. So that was a that are, very odd year. <laughs> for those that are new to Fireside Chat, uh, we do this every year. We look ahead to the season. I have 16 questions for us that Matt and I are both going to answer about what we're predicting for the season. Um, we will talk about our our thoughts on this and i will record these answers we'll look back at them at the midpoint of the season and then at the end and see how well we did or not and you know throwing crystal balls away and you know anything to do with crystal balls episode. are expensive to keep tossing out matt yeah oh well, that's why we gotta do better this year all right you ready to go sure will jonathan huberto be at least a point per game player yes I think so as well. So that means he's going to get at least 82 points, which I think for the contract he has, he has to be. I don't think he'll ever break 100 again in his career, but I don't think it's uh, it's too much to ask for him to get to, uh, you know, 80, let's call it 82 points, a point a game for the money he's making. Yeah, and realistically, um, like he was fairly neutered by Sutter system last year. Like when you have a creative guy who catches people with passes on the rush and then you prevent that style of offense, you're going to see that guy's off wing. Yeah. You're going to see that guy's numbers go way, way, way down. (laughs) You know, you have to actually utilize your player's strengths 
And I think that's a key with having Mark Savard as the offense coach because he and Huberto are virtually the same kind of guy in how they played the game and they see the game. So, and I think that's the main reason why he was hired was to foster Huberto's strengths and get him back up to being the ten and a half million dollar player that he is. Yeah, I mean, if we look at his career, he has 31, then 28, 54, 59, 26, 69, 92, 78, 61, 115, and then 55 points. So rough math in my head, he averages to about a 62 point a year player, but he's also, I think, on a in a spot now where he has to perform. Well, and how would you say um, the quality of the Florida Panthers for a large portion of that, they were a garbage team. And they were my second favorite team, so I, I'm i very keenly aware of how bad they were. So, <laughs> you know, it, it some of those lower point totals indicate that, yeah, he had nobody to pass to. That's true. Yep. <laughs> you know, and, like, he, he's more of, like, the traditional 70, 80, 90-point guy, generally, if he's got players that can actually receive a pass. And for the early portion of his career he, he didn't really have that in florida but as they got better you saw his numbers blow up and he's more that type of guy and always has been it's just you know when you're playing with a bad team <laughs> it does not help you in a lot of ways prediction two will markstrom have a bounce back season i don't know how we're going to quantify that but i guess will markstrom Look like Be a, a league a league average starter as the baseline. Sure, let's do that. What do you think? No, you don't think so. No, I think he's going to lose the starting job entirely, and Vladar's going to take over. If we say league average, I think he can get to league average. Yeah, I, just because I, I also think there's some there's some bad starters out there, so then the league average is going to go down this year. Yeah, I just uh, I think that. He's well. How do you say? He's throughout past the his prime, for sure. Yeah, throughout the preseason, the same things that happened last year happened in every single preseason game, which is where it's like I've seen this game too many times, at over and over and over again between last year and this year, where it's like, how do you say? Two years ago, when Markstrom was really good, he had an uh, internal confidence about himself, and like the saves would just happen. Like he would, he was on his game. Then he, last year, it seemed like one mistake would spiral, and then, and then, and then, and then, and we're you know through the preseason, he has not shown any internal confidence in his. Like, that game against Vancouver was bad for him. And, like, letting that first shot on in from where and how hard that shot was, like, that's the save that every goaltender well, should make. How many make. times did he let in the first shot in the game? Oh, I know. And that's where, like, I'm very worried about Markstrom. And, you know, like, it, the good thing is, is that if things do go sideways like he only has two years left on his contract instead of three and i'm sure there are a number of teams that their goaltending is in a situation where a cheap stop gap like cheap acquisition cost stop gap for two years is palatable yeah he's got a no movement clause it's a full no move so that that's a but that's another story for when we get there yeah well, I'm sure like if things go off the rails that uh, I think both the player and the team would want to move on. Yeah. Yeah, you could be right. I think there's some value to keeping him if you can afford him as a backup because I still think he's got a lot of mentorship especially for a young guy like Wolf, but we'll get into that another time. Yeah. I don't want us to run too long with this week's episode. Yeah. Will Wolf play more than 10 games for the Flames this season? Nope. I say no. I I think he might start 5 or 6. I don't see them for him to play more than 10. I think Markstrom would have to lose his job. Even if he's yeah. the backup, I think he sits on the bench for most of those. Yeah. 
Uh, I think that, like, unless there's a, a significant injury, that, and even then you'd probably see the other guy play most of the games while the other guy's out. Um, I agree. So I think you'll we'll get see. a couple games at the end of the season and stuff like that, maybe on a road trip if they've got, you know, three games in four nights, but I don't see him playing more than 10. Yeah. I didn't say starting, but I don't even see him coming in relief for more than 10. Yeah, I, I would be a little bit surprised unless they decide to move on from one or the other, which is possible. It's just, uh, it, it would depend. And I think that would be largely on, like, it, how would you say, if Markstrom and Vladar both struggle at the start of the year, like for the first month and like they're just bad, then I could see them just waving Vladar and bringing Wolf up and just saying, okay, kid, have fun. You know, uh, but they, they would both have to be terrible uh, to be, you know, we'll, in that situation. We'll say no on that one because that's not yeah. likely to happen. No, I agree. Last season, Chris Tan Chris Tana have played 65 games for the Flames. He's 33 going into the season. This is a guy that's known to not really play a full season. I think he's only ever played one full season. It was 21-22. Does Tana play 60-plus games this year? I think 60 is around... Yeah, I'll say yes. I, I, th I think he gets banged up enough where he needs to miss a couple weeks here and there, but nothing that's like he's out for several months or anything like that. I'm going to say no, because it seems like every year his injuries keep him out for longer and longer, and I'm worried that he might finally be kind of at the end of that rope. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully he plays more than 65, 70. I agree. Who will have a breakout season this year? Um, this is actually a very tough question. How would you say? I'm going to have to say Coronado just because, uh, frankly, I do not think any of the other guys are going to break out into anything much more than they are. I think Cor Coronado's who I had too, and I was debating between Coronado and Vladar. I don't think Vladar is going to be given the chance to break out because I don't think, and, and again, we, we just went down that road, so we'll go down it again, but I don't think that the scenarios work out for him to play more than, you know, 25 games. I think everyone else in the team just needs to perform to where they should be. There's no one I don't think that's going to break out except for Coronado. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go with Coronado on that one as well. Who will struggle this season? I'm, I'm going to go, go with the I'm going to go with Andrew Mangiapane. Yeah? Yeah. I think that he's going to get frustrated and end up falling down the lineup. See, and you've suit. liked this kid for a long time, and I've said for years in the show, I think he's a second liner at best. Yeah, and uh, I, with how he played last year, frankly, that was being too polite to him. Uh, I, I think, think that, I, I honestly think he's a third liner. I think he's played higher in the lineup because the Flames have needed him to, and they've been sparse. I think this guy's way overpaid, and I think he's probably a third liner, a second liner on a good day. Yeah. Well, and when he was good, like he was noticeable each game, and we haven't really seen him getting in the spots that he was getting in. Um, his shots are where he was like hitting the post and getting it in. He's now hitting the outside of the post or just missing wide entirely. And, you know, he needs to have a bounce back year. And like, it, frankly, he is one of those players because he's so overpaid and he's young. Um, like he's in danger of getting bought out at the end of the year. Cause it'd only be a $2 million buyout instead of a uh, $4 million buyout for the last season of his contract. And like, if he's only playing like a two or $3 million player, you have to look at that as an option. And as much as, you know, like that's not a great situation, you know, it's frustrating because, you know, he has the potential and ability to do more. It's just for whatever reason, last year, nothing really went well for him. And, I'm not really seeing any different again through preseason. Again, it is preseason, but you know, it, he needed to, I think, show more I this agree. year yeah. and he didn't. Yeah. I'm going to go with, I'm going to tie for mine. I think Jacob Markstrom's going to struggle. I think like you, he probably won't have a back, uh good season. And I'm worried it might also be Elias Lindholm. I think that, 
especially if there's no contract done there, that could be a distraction for him. I think if he's on a line with Huberto and I think eventually Coronado gets put up there, he might kind of be the odd man out on that line. And I, I don't know. We're going to see the, the production we're expecting from Lindholm. No. And like, how would you say I, I could see a situation where like he's wanting $9 million a season, but he's only putting up like a five or $6 million performance. And, He's going to have to either round down or, you know, so, move on. It's quite the rounding. You and I took different math. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of them must be that new math stuff. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> um, who do well, you think will... You, you round down by turning the number upside down. <laughs> ah, there you go. It's like when we say that uh, Giordano's five is just the two and they flipped it. Yeah. With well, the exactly. jersey font. Yeah. <laughs> um... Not so much with these jerseys, but if you go back and look at some of the old jerseys or listen to the old episodes, you'll hear our, our thoughts on that. Who's going to surprise us this season? I'm going to say uh, Walker Dewar. How so? I, I think he's going to impress and push his way up into the top nine and become a really good secondary scoring threat. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to go with a defenseman on this. I'm going to go with Nikita Zadorov. I think... Zadorov has been a guy that I've criticized and maybe they're paying too much for. He's a guy that often made some bad mistakes. I think his game came quite far last year and I can see him becoming a top four on this team. Um, I He's big. I think his, he's starting to establish himself as more than just a big defenseman. And I think he could surprise us with the way this game progresses this year. Yeah. And that is a player that I would absolutely love if the Flames got him under contract for long term. I think there's still some work to be done before they do that, though. Yeah. And, you know, like, even if, like, he he was, like, a five-year, $6 million per defenseman, if he plays like he did last year and carries forward, that would be perfectly all right. And maybe that's my definition of surprise is if he continues what he did last year. Yeah. Because he was definitely a surprise last year in a positive way offensively. Who will be the top point getter for the Flames this year? Um, I'm going to go with Huberto, um, just because he should be <laughs> more yeah, than I, anything. Like, I if, if the, yeah. Unless something weird happens where like one of the other players just goes off for some reason, like say Coronado goes crazy and wins the Calder or something stupid, you know, like it, it, it would have to be Huberto. Yeah. And I think if, you know, if Huberto's not, again, I think the flames have to look at what are we spending this money on? Yeah. And, well, I think, like, if he struggles like that, then you're looking at, well, this team's Cornado's kind of... Because making a- sub-1 million. So if you go to him and say, look, this guy who's making a tenth of what you're making outscored you, we got problems with this uh, yeah. with this cap makeup. Yeah. Well, and th- then you're kind of in the situ- same situation that Dallas was in uh, when uh, Ben and Sagan signed their contracts, and you have the higher quality veteran guy to help the younger guys as the flames retool around them uh, and kind of just wait to burn those contracts down, uh, you know, at the end of it. But, you know, it, it, I, like I would not expect Hoover abilities to disappear. He's too good of a cerebral player for that. It's just, you know, hopefully he puts up the numbers. This one's going to be tougher because we don't know the whole lineup, but who do you think, Let's go forward and defense. Who do you think will be the first call up in for the forwards and the first call for the defense? Well, assuming that uh, they do not make the opening day lineup uh, for the forwards, I would go with Adam Klapka. Um, and for the defense, uh, probably Gilbert. I see, and I think I think Gilbert's going to make it. So I'm going to say Klapka for the forwards, and I think Soloviev for the defense. Yeah. Because I think I think that Gilbert is old enough that he's yeah, and he showed right. enough last year. Yeah, you're right. Uh, he should be the number seven. Right, like he showed yeah, enough I, in the NHL level to at least make him seven. Yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, if I could change my answer, I would sure. say Soloviev. Then, because yeah, I uh, how would you say I still have like Shillington penciled in my mental lineup for the Flames. But you know, adjusting for reality, yeah, he is the number. So seven. since we're both on the on that page, why don't we say that the t- first forward called up will either be Klapkar Schwint, whoever doesn't make the lineup. Yeah, I agree. And the defenseman will be Soloviev. 
Yeah. I could see Poirier if he has a really good year as well. Yeah, I don't know if he's the first guy you bring up, though. I think you got to go with the guy who's shown, you know, that he earned that first. Yeah, I agree. I think Poirier comes in near the end if they're going to bring him up. Well, and I think it depends on what type of defenseman gets hurt. That's too. true. Like yeah. It, it, you know, like if Tanev Zadorov or uh, Osterley get hurt, then you'd probably bring Soloviev. But if an offensive guy goes down, then I think you'd bring up Poirier to help mitigate the offensive loss. Yeah, and, and I mean, there's also um, there's there's also D. Simone down there who I could see maybe being the first call up, even though it's not as exciting. Yeah. Do the Flames win the Battle of Alberta this year? Uh, one of them. Yes. Let's say let's say all the the entire battle for the year. No. For whatever reason, they just. The Flames' problem is the exact same problem they had with the Steen twins until they figured it out, which they respect McDavid and Dreisaitl too much. They need to get in their those guys' face more and, you know, interfere with them and push them around. And the Flames used to respect the Sedins through the early part of their career, and they'd just have a passing clinic until they scored. And it wasn't until, hey, we can actually hit those guys. Then, then like, the Sedins stop scoring on the Flames at will. And I think that the Flames need to figure out that, hey, those guys are actually players you can actually hit. And, <laughs> you know, um, Zadorov, have fun. <laughs> Did the Flames win the Heritage Classic? Yes. That would you be think? my one game this year that I think that they'll win. Just because, you know, ruined their celebration. I'm going to say no to the Battle of Alberta, and it pains me to say that as a Flames fan. And I'm going to say no to the Heritage Classic, just because, I mean, the Flames won their first one against Montreal. They didn't look good in their second one against uh, the Jets. Yeah. I don't know if they're... I think that being in Edmonton, there's going to be... I I don't know. I just don't think the Flames are going to do it. Yeah. Um, Where will the Flames finish in the regular season in the Pacific Division? Uh, I, I'm going to say third. Okay. Who do you think will be above them? Edmonton and Vegas. I'm saying second. I think Edmonton will be above them. I, I'm suspect of Vegas is goaltending. Yeah. Um, honestly, uh, I do not think that the Oilers are going to be the runaway winners. But, I was watching yeah, a thing on TikTok from all the sports net, like, analysts and they all think that Edmonton's going to the finals that is a laugh like Matthias Eckholm is a good defenseman and that was a great addition for that team he is one guy (laughs) on the blue line who actually knows how to play defense you need more than one guy who actually knows how how to actually play defense they're not going to go anywhere in the playoffs like they might win a round or two but when they actually meet somebody who actually knows how to play hockey, yeah, they're gone. <laughs> how many points did the Flames get in the regular season? I'm going to go with 98. I was going to say 100. Yeah. This is the question every year that you answer the same thing to, so I already have your answer written down. How far will the Flames go in the playoffs? Every year you say Stanley Cup Finals. Um, I'm going to say the loss in the first round. Really? Yep. Wow. I, how would you say I do not think the goaltending is good enough uh, flatly. I, you know, I, they need to make changes uh, for them to have any postseason success because neither one of those guys, I think, has it in them to win a series. Okay. I'm I, saying- how would you say I, I think that the team itself is good enough to win a round or two, but I, I think the goaltending will... Just like in the the Edmonton Oilers series a couple years ago, I think the goaltending will just torpedo the team. See, and I think I was thinking about that, and I think that we're both a little hesitant on goaltending. I think this is the year for Vladar to step up, and I also think that we saw last year a whole bunch of teams do better than they should have with the goaltending they had. So I'm going to be a little more optimistic. I'm shocked that you don't think they're going to go all the way this year. Oh, Um, no. I'm going to say the third round. I think they can muscle up two two rounds of wins, and I don't think they make it past third round. Yeah, no. Uh, how would you say? Uh, 
this team needs to actually show uh, that they can win and you have to actually show that you can do it and like I this think they team have to make paper, it to the second round for yeah. it to be at least a modicum of success yeah and like realistically like the problem that this team has had um similarly to the Toronto Blue Jays where they have a really good team on paper and that then when it comes to crunch time and the games actually matter they forget how to do the basics and then they fail because you know even just the basic stuff that should make you successful like they did deploy that in that series against Dallas where they ran over the stars and if it wasn't for Ottinger having a historically good first round like that should have been a four game sweep but you know then the in the Oilers series they had that one the game one that they won uh, where it was a river hockey game and then they forgot how to do the fundamentals of playing hockey and they've not really recovered from that and until they can show the work that you know you actually need to do the little detail things shift in shift out shift in shift out i don't see them going very far and that's fair and i and we'll talk more about this next week i was going to talk about it this week but we're running long but i want to talk about the underdog effect on the flames for next week so we'll save that for for next week's episode um next one's a little bit off the board it's calgary wranglers Wranglers came so close to the finals last year. Do you think they can make the finals this year with the roster and the coach they've got? Yeah, uh, they're as good of a team in the AHL as any. They have the best goalie in the league. They'll go as far as they can. And, you know, there's not realistically anybody who's significantly better in the AHL than their team. So it just comes down to how the games go. And... Like the the Wranglers, it had they got a couple more bounces in their game uh, in that final series that they had, they could have won the championship. They didn't, and the other team did. So, I think that they're a younger team this year with a a, a more experienced coach than we've seen in the past. And I I'm not as convinced they're going to go as far. I think that this is a team that's still going to have uh, some struggles in terms of. I guess finding identity, especially with Peltier gone, um, I, I think that it's it's a team that might take a bit of a step back this year. Yeah, well, and you're seeing uh, guys like Peterson take, like he took a fairly big step in the preseason to the point where he looked like a potential NHLer now. Um, so I think you're going to start to see guys emerge on that team um, to be like uh, guys like Schwint and Zari and Pe- Patterson where, you know, looking more like NHL caliber guys on the top two lines down there. I think you're right. Yeah. I think that, uh, that there's still some growth there though. And I, I think that there might be some guys that have to learn how to play a little bit differently, but we'll, we'll look at that as the season gets started. I mean, right now we don't even know who's on that roster fully. Yeah, for sure. Here's one that's a little bit, out of left field, but I thought I'd put in here. Do Ryan Husko or Craig Conroy lose their job this season? No. No, I think I, I've heard some people talking about this, and I think that you can't swap out a new regime this early into it. No, and how would you say as much as it sound it'll sound strange, like Conroy has to clean up the mess that Treliving left him. And like the teams will very much in disarray um, from two years ago, this off season, uh, losing Gaudreau and Kachuk. And, you know, the pieces haven't been sorted out. And then the whole drama was Sutter last season. You know, like the team needs to sort out what they actually have, what they need. And, like, those answers will come via the players themselves. And, you know, like you'll see guys like Lindholm, like if they're going to be a foundational piece, you know, like contracts will be signed and then you can, you know, not have to think about that aspect of the team where, you know, like if you're, say, losing, say, Hannafin, uh, Tanev, and Zadorov off your blue line at, into free agency, like 
you know, as good as Poirier is, he's A, one guy, and B, okay, now what? And, like, the, the team has to sort out all of those details before they can actually take the next steps into... As Tree, you mm. say it's a process. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see because... This, this is just the first chapter of a new book. Yeah, and this team has a lot of talent uh, throughout the organization, and the young guys all look pretty good. Um, you know, guys like Poirier, Moran, um, Coronado, uh, Peltier, like, those guys, Zari, like, they all look like decent quality NHLers in much the way that guys like Dubé and Munjapane did when they came into the NHL and, you know, seeing how those guys sort themselves out and then, you know, how the team just builds moving forward. And it it's not a process that you can do overnight. And I no. think like this is at least a two or three year situation at a minimum, uh, like even if it's just a placeholder for a rebuild, um, like say certain players just play terribly and like Hoover does like a fifty point player net from now on, you know, like the that's you know a different situation and you have to kind of guide your team in a different direction then and you know it, it'll be one that we'll have to see as the situation develops, how everything turns out and then make adjustments from there. Last question in our prediction game. Look deep into that crystal ball. What do the flames need to do to be successful this year? And we look back and we say the flames were successful. What is that metric? Um, I'll give you mine first. If you want, yeah, what you go about? ahead. I'm yeah. going to go two ways. I think it's a, it's a two faced coin. I think the Flames need a second round win. I mean, they made it to the second round and lost Edmonton a couple of years ago. I think they need to win the second round because this team is able to get to the first round. They made it to the second round with a, you know, arguably a lesser roster. I think this team needs to prove that either they're ready to go or they need a massive sell off at the trade deadline if they're not where they expect to be. I think either one of those could be seen as a success this year. If the Flames just kind of make it to the playoffs or barely miss, and don't make a whole lot of changes and are just this mediocre team trying to make the same core do something different as we've seen for the last couple of years. I think that that's another huge fail. Yeah. Like if this team is in the like seven to 10 or 12 range at the trade deadline, I think that they should sell anybody that's a free agent to be that has, has not indicated that they're going to resign. And, you know, basically we want pen to paper before the trade deadline Otherwise, we're moving. And even you. if there's an asset like a Markstrom that you can sell, who is locked down, I think you got to look at that then too. Oh yeah, any hockey deals, any anything. Uh, like realistically, you look at the guys that are the important pieces, like for the next few years, and it's guys like uh, Peltier, like Poirier, like Zari, like Coronado. We need more draft picks. So like, if certain guys are not willing to stay, and we're in that same middle boat you know fringe playoff team not playoff team then you have to just cut bait and you know like as much as it would suck to say lose Tanev, Hannafin, Zadorov, and Lindholm you know if that's how the it plays out well hey at least you have one hell of a haul of draft picks and prospects to look forward to the next season so what's your success metric for the flames uh, it, very much uh, oddly in a similar vein of if they make the playoffs they need to find success and not just be the the San Jose Sharks of old or the Minnesota Wild of old so what is you, playoff success at least winning a round and you know not being uh, walked all over in the second round like so if, if we say a competitive second round exit, yeah, or better, like, yeah. Like, how would you say? Like, if they say play the Oilers in the second round, you don't want to see them getting curb stomped after four or five games. Well, like, I was going to add that to mind. Even if we play the Oilers, I don't want them to lose. Like, they've got to beat the Oilers if they play them in the playoffs. 
Yeah, and really well, seven like, games, four games, a hundred games, how many games it takes, they got to beat them. Yeah, and even if they lose but don't get embarrassed like last time, that would be okay in my books. Because you know whoever wins the other division is just going to kick the ever-loving crap out of the Oilers. So you, there's no real worry of them actually advancing to the finals. But, <laughs> you know, it, it's just one of those where it, it's they need to find a way to actually have some success and not be pushovers. And, like, this team going back to the 0304 run have always had – higher expectations due to on paper being a really good team when they've been a really good team and then not having the effort levels to match the talent levels and you know like very much like the Toronto Blue Jays one of the best teams in baseball only scored one run in two games and then they're they're out and you know the Flames had the same kind of playoff against the Oilers and, you know, you just can't do that and consider yourself a successful team. Well, let's try to forget that playoff and look ahead to a new season. I'm going to take these. I'm going to put them in the time capsule, lock them up till January, and we'll look back and see what we're doing. But yeah, uh, and if they and if they're in that middling range, have a clearance sale, sell everything. Do not hold on to anything just to let them walk away. If you can trade it, trade it. And that's, you know. Do not let leave any stone unturned. It, you know, <laughs> even if you're getting that late round pick for, you know, like an Osterly, go for it. Like the Flames have shown they can do good things with late round picks. Yeah, exactly. So Matt, one more set of predictions we need to make is as we do always, we need to look ahead to the week that's coming and we're going to finally record these. Our preseason's over. Now it's, it's business and we got to track this again. You won last year for the first time at this game. Yes. After 11 years, you won. Yeah, well, you see, when everything goes wrong, I go right. <laughs> Four to one was the win last year, which I think is a bad thing because you were very pessimistic and you won more often than not. So Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> this week, yeah. we got two games on the Flames schedule. Their home opener and the season opener is on October 11th at the Dome. There's apparently still tickets available if you uh, want to be there. And that's against the Winnipeg Jets, 8 p.m. start time. And then they have an early game already on Saturday, the 14th, in Pittsburgh against the Pittsburgh Penguins, a 5 p.m. start time. So I'll give you my picks first. I think they're going to lose to Winnipeg and win to Pittsburgh. They seem to have a tough time in their home opener, and they seem to have a tough time against the Jets the last couple of years. I'm going to be even more pessimistic. Loss, loss to start the year. Wow. And I think they'll get blown out against Winnipeg. Really? Yeah. I think it'll be like a five or six one game. Yikes. Okay. Do you think we see Dan Vladar this week? Yeah. At, in relief for Marks from in the first game. <laughs> in the first game when they get blown out. Okay. That yeah. makes sense. Um, well, if you disagree with us or if you agree with us, if you have any predictions or you want to tell us how wrong we are, we'd love to hear from you. You can do like Al did when he left that comment that we read earlier. You can respond on firesidechat.ca. Just go to this week's show and leave a comment. You can find us on Facebook. We're facebook.com slash fireside chat on Twitter. We're at fireside podcast. Or if you go to our website, firesidechat.ca at the very top, you'll see all the social media profiles and the links. We're on uh, Twitter or X, we're on Blue Sky, we're on Macedon, we're on Instagram, we have our YouTube channel. So wherever you want to talk to us, we're there. You can also go to the contact page, send us an email, or there's a little widget on our website if you're on the desktop version of the site. It's not on the mobile yet. You can even leave a, send us a voicemail if you want to. So we'd love to hear from you. Let us know if you think we're right, we're wrong, um, if you agree with us. And we will talk to you next week after the first week of the season's in the books. And Matt, Next week, I'll tease it for everybody. I want to talk about the underdog effect for the Flames. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how things shake out. And, you know, hopefully we have some positive things to talk about next week. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.